If you're new with us, we're working our way through Luke's gospel, and we find ourselves in chapter 17 today as we look at these four aspects of discipleship uh, that our Lord gives us. And let's pray together as we look at them. Father, we thank you for your word. Another Sunday to gather together and to, uh, to feast upon the riches of, of Scripture. And we pray that uh, today as we look into your word, you would open up our eyes and hearts to behold wonderful things from your word and that we would not just uh, go through the uh, religious motions today, but that we would take your word in, uh, absorb it, and apply it to our lives for the sake of Christ we pray. Amen. I'm sure many of you have seen these progressive insurance commercials about not becoming like your parents. Uh, Dr. Rick is a life coach who teaches homeowners and, uh, about, the, about the pitfalls of aging and tries to uh, train his disciples uh, in not becoming like their parents. And uh, the kids usually laugh as they watch their parents following the habits of their parents. Parents often chuckle watching these commercials knowing that they're following after their parents. And grandparents laugh knowing that their children are turning into them. There are several great scenes uh, where Dr. Rick, for example, uh, in, in a restaurant says to uh, those who are trying to be like their parents, the waitress doesn't need to know your name. Or the guys who are in the hardware store, they see a guy with the blue hair and they're trying not to stare because it has so shaken them. And he says, we all see it. We all see it. And one of my favorites is when uh, the, the guy is standing over the plumber trying to give the plumber that he hired to fix the, the plumbing uh, instruction about what he should be doing. And he says, remember, you hired him. You hired him. Dr. Rick is a comedic character, but he brings to mind the, the fact that many people today are influenced by some kind of life coach, some type of teacher, some, some podcaster or news anchor. And the question before us today is, who is discipling you? Self-help gurus abound, don't they? Life coaches abound. There are talking heads everywhere. Everyone has a podcast these days. We're bombarded with messages about everything. Currently, we've been bombarded with political ads. How many are you ready to get beyond that? We've been, we've been hearing about all sorts of sad news and all sorts of warnings, like there is a butter shortage. That's serious, serious. But there is a voice amidst all the other voices that is unlike any other voice. The primary voice for a life of a disciple of Jesus must be Jesus. We, we don't come to Jesus' word and think, well, he's one teacher among many others. Because no one speaks with divine authority like Jesus Christ. He speaks the words of life about the most important things of life. And we are wise, as we've looked at before, when we build our lives upon his word. In Luke chapter 6, verse 40, you recall how Jesus says, A disciple is not above his teacher, but everyone, when he is fully trained, will be like his teacher. In other words, it's important who you listen to because you become like that person that you're following. And so we want to hear Jesus' word because we want to become like him. And you notice in our text today in verse 1 that the, the focus has now shifted back to the disciples. And so Jesus is training these disciples about what it looks like to, to, uh, to live out the faith uh, as, this, as these new leaders that will form this messianic community called the church. In Luke's gospel, we, we see that Jesus uh, is usually addressing one of three groups of people. He's either addressing the crowds, those who are not yet Christians. He's addressing the religious leaders who were usually opposed to him. And sometimes he's addressing the disciples specifically. And here it is now, he's concentrating his attention upon his disciples, and he gives us four aspects, four very important aspects of faithful discipleship. And they're given in, in, very short, in a very short, concise, almost uh, proverbial-like manner, sort of a collection of, of proverbs in, in many ways. And the common thread through these, these four aspects of discipleship really pertains to our, our basic walk with the Lord, and, and our, our walk with one another, as you see a strong emphasis here in this text on living out the gospel in community. So let me highlight those four aspects as we walk through them uh, one at a time. Jesus speaks of the peril of sin, the practice of forgiveness, the power of faith, 
and the posture of a servant. So first of all, the peril of sin. He begins by talking about temptation and the call to personal holiness. Jesus speaks about the inevitability of temptation in verse 1 when he says, temptations to, uh, uh, to sin are sure to come. And all God's people said, amen. <laughs> we know this, don't we? Now when Jesus returns, sin will be eradicated. Temptation will be gone. But for now, temptations are everywhere. We have opportunities every minute of our day to cave into temptation. Now the term Jesus uses is very uh, striking. In English, in the ESV, temptations to sin is just one Greek word. And it's the word scandalon, where we get the word scandal from. It literally meant a stumbling block or a trap. Jesus is saying stumbling blocks are sure to come. It originally meant the bait stick in a trap, and later it referred to the trap itself, this word. So traps are sure to be set for you. Stumbling blocks are sure to be put in your way. So there are going to be many traps, many stumbling blocks that will seek to, to make us stumble, to trip us up, and cause us to sin. He wants his disciples to be aware of this. Now, for us, we may face this in a variety of ways. What do these traps look like? Well, there are intellectual traps that are laid for you. Wanting you to doubt Christian belief. There may be cultural traps. The influence of, of pop icons, for example, that may tempt you to, to, to be lured away to ungodliness. Commercial traps. How much advertisement is all about temptation? I recall in an in-flight magazine one time, an, an ad uh, trying to get you to go to Vegas said, quote, just the right amount of wrong. It could be relational traps. You may have friends that are seeking to pull you away from Jesus. It may be church traps, spiritual leaders who lead people astray because they compromise the truth or because they have a domineering leadership style. All sorts of traps abound, and behind all of these traps is the tempter himself, who is seeking to lure us into sin and seeking to devour us. Now, while temptation itself may not be sin, we know that it becomes sinful when we give in to it, as James 1, 14 and 15 says. The writer of Hebrews tells us that Jesus was tempted in all points, yet without sin. So he wants his disciples to be on guard. He wants us to be on guard. He wants us to be aware. He wants us to remember that we're in a war. And it doesn't really matter where we go. We can't escape in this fallen world the reality of temptation. Uh, the old movie, uh, The Village, was about how these people tried to insulate themselves from society, thinking they could just form this kind of utopian community. And what they soon found out is that sin wasn't just out there. It was in here. And that the temptation, you cannot be insulated enough to remove yourself from temptation. The church father, Jerome, uh, wrote about going out into the desert. And while he was out there as a monk, he, he wrote about how much temptation he had, how his body burned with passionate desires uh, for sexual sin. You, you can't escape this world of temptation. It's inevitable, so we must be on our guard. Satan never sleeps. Sin never sleeps, and we must take it seriously. John Owen, in writing about temptation and sin, said, Sin always aims at the utmost. Every time it raises to tempt or entice, might it have its own course, it would go to the utmost. Every unclean glance would be adultery if it could. Every covetous desire would be oppression. Every thought of unbelief would be atheism. Might it go to its head. Then he famously said, be killing sin, or it will be killing you. We must flee it, as 1 Corinthians 6 says, to, to flee sexual immorality there, Paul says in verse 18. And we must fight this temptation with a deeper delight in Christ. One of the things we must do is tend to our affections, to our loves. Because we, it's not just about saying no to sin, it's about saying yes to Christ. This is how we fight temptation with a deeper delight in Jesus than we have for sin. As again, Owen said, fill your affections with the cross of Christ 
and there will be no room for sin. And so that's part of the purpose of our gathering today. As we sing together, as we fellowship with one another, that our affections would be stirred afresh for Jesus Christ, that there would be no room for sin in our hearts. That's the first thing Jesus says, that it's inevitable. And then Jesus shifts in verse one to say to the disciples that you must avoid enticing others to sin. See what he says there? But woe to the one through whom they come. So some people will try to lead people into sin. Some people will be out there setting traps. Some people will be out there setting stumbling blocks. And there are a variety of ways that we could cause someone to sin. In 1 Corinthians uh, 10 and Romans 14, Paul talks about the weaker brother and the stronger brother and not leading another brother to stumble. The, the kings in 1 and 2 Kings set up idols time and time again, leading people into sin. In the book of Revelation, we read about those seven churches and a few of them were uh, condemned for tolerating false teaching that promoted idolatry and immorality. And Jesus here may have false teaching in mind when he's saying, woe to those through whom it comes. He may have the Pharisees in mind who were uh, leading people astray, who were discouraging people from following Jesus. And we read of the danger of false teaching in a variety of places. But, but false teaching is not only through a formal position of, a, of a, some kind of leader. All kinds of ways, there are all kinds of ways you could be a false teacher. All kinds of ways you could be a, an influence of others into sin. And we must be on our guard that we're not that, and we must be on guard against those who are influencing us in those ways. So, for example, this could come from a parent. If a parent is not giving any spiritual direction to their child, or when their child gains a spiritual interest, they downplay it and tell them it's not very important. Or it come, could come through a spouse. One spouse encouraging another spouse, you don't really need to attend Sunday church. Or perhaps speaking harshly to their spouse that then in turn causes them to sin in response. There are a variety of ways we can, we can do this, right? This could come through a boyfriend or girlfriend. The boyfriend mocks the girlfriend's faith or pushes the girlfriend to sexual immorality. How many teenagers... How many college students, how many young adults, how many older adults have been led away from Jesus because of an ungodly relationship? It could come through a church member or a friend. One complaining spirit can cause another person to be discontent. Or, or one, you know, one occasion of speaking unfairly about a person could wrongly influence that person's opinion of the other. Or bragging about our accomplishments might give rise to envy in another person. It could come through a friend, leading you to go places you shouldn't go or to say things you shouldn't say. There are many ways you could become a spiritual hindrance to other people. And so the question before us in this verse is, am I causing others to sin? Am I leading people astray by my actions, by my words? Jesus has a strong word here for these disciples because they will have such a responsibility as teachers and leaders to lead people to truth, to lead people to godliness and not lead them astray like the false teachers were doing. Now, Jesus says something strong in verse two. He speaks of the fate of the tempter. For those that are leading people astray, Jesus has a strong word. It would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were cast into the sea than he should cause one of these little ones to sin. This is a very striking image, isn't it? A millstone was a very hard, heavy stone that was uh, drug over grain in order to crush grain. Jesus says it's better if you have a millstone necklace than to lead someone away from the faith and for you to jump in Falls Lake. Better for you to do that than lead someone into sin. A harsh death would be better than the judgment that you'll face. That's very severe, isn't it? Here's one of the examples of how seriously Jesus took sin. And it's not the only place. So Jesus said some things like in Matthew 5, if your right eye causes you to sin, do what? Pull it out, right? If your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off. Like, take it seriously. 
do whatever you, you need to to avoid sin. And here he is saying, for those who are leading these little ones astray, there is a heavy price to pay. And again, he may have the Pharisees in mind, those who were leading the, the new believers, the tax collectors and sinners astray. Little ones can refer to believers in general. You can also refer to, to young people or to young believers. And it doesn't really matter. The point is the same. We should never lead any believer away from the faith. Little ones is a very striking way to say that we need protection. We need care. We're vulnerable. We can be influenced. And so be careful who you listen to. Make sure you're following the right teacher. Now, Jesus backs it up then with a word of personal responsibility to the disciples when he says, uh, pay attention to yourselves. Pay attention. This present imperative verb that Jesus uses, just one word, prosekete, means to constantly watch yourself. This is similar to what Paul says in uh, 1 Timothy 4.16 when he says to Timothy, watch your life, watch your doctrine, and then he adds, persist in this. Don't ever stop watching your life and your doctrine. It's a warning. And Jesus warns us because Jesus loves us. And Jesus wants us to walk in the way of wisdom. He wants us to walk in the way of godliness. And it is in the way of wisdom and in the way of godliness that we find joy, that we find meaning, that we find purpose. So Jesus is about to send these disciples out into the world. In a short amount of time, he will be gone. They are going to be leaders in his church. And he wants them to know that temptations abound. He wants them to avoid enticing anybody into sin. And he wants them to stay on guard against temptation. And he's after that for our lives as well. It's a call to personal holiness. That's what Jesus is calling us to today. Character is more important than gifting. Spiritual fruit is more important than spiritual gifts. We cannot do a whole lot about gifting. That is a sovereign distribution that the Lord gives. But what we must cultivate is godly character. What we must cultivate is spiritual fruit that comes from walking in the way of godliness. As McShane put it well, it's not great talents that God so much blesses as it is great likeness to Jesus. So that's the first thing Jesus says. Secondly, he speaks of the practice of forgiveness. Verses three and four, closely related to this, Jesus follows this teaching about uh, the peril of sin, about the practice of forgiveness and the, the need to assist other believers in their Christian walk. And you see this emphasis on community here. When he begins by saying, if your brother sins, so sins in general, rebuke him. And then, in verse 4, if he sins against you personally. And he does this seven times, and then he gives the instructions. So the first thing that he says here is to correct the person who has sinned. Rebuke. This, this doesn't mean we tell them off. <laughs> this means that we have a humble courage to confront instead of looking the other way. Now, when we read this, we must balance it with the rest of Scripture. This is not a call for us to become the, the righteous police, uh, the call to be busybodies or to meddle in the affairs of others. Uh, previously, we've looked in Luke chapter 6 that we must take care that there's no log in our eye as we look at the speck in another person's eye. So this must proceed from a heart of love. This must be done with gentleness. But he says, if this person has sinned, rebuke them. And he says, if he sins against you personally. So what is it that you should do if someone sins against you? Here's our little test. Should you, A, go to the leaders of the church? B, ignore it. C, talk about that person behind their back. Or D, go to the person. D. The answer is D, good class, very good, very good. <laughs> You got one right. Tests are hard, right? But that one was pretty easy. I was leading you into it. It's usually C, I think, but this one was D. Uh, and so that's what we do. We go to the person. And he says, if they repent, verse 4, forgive them. When the offender repents, we have the privilege and responsibility of forgiving them. And this forgiveness should be done without limits. He says seven times in a day. How many times do we then forgive the person? We continue to forgive the person when they repent. Now this is very easy to listen to, this is very hard to do. 
C.S. Lewis said it well. We all agree that forgiveness is a beautiful idea until we have to practice it. <laughs> we can agree on that, can't we? It's a very beautiful idea. I'm not doing it. <laughs> so you, there's a dual challenge going on here. You, you cannot be too afraid to correct, but you cannot be too resentful to forgive. We need help. And the good news is we have it. Jesus has given us the Holy Spirit, right? He's given us his heart. He's changed our lives. Now, this raises, forgiveness always raises a bunch of questions, and I'm not going to deal with all of them. Like, what if the, the request for forgiveness is insincere? Or what if the act that they committed really hurt people? Well, obviously, there are qualifications, right? Like the fact that forgiveness doesn't mean there are no consequences, for actions. Jesus is simply addressing the need to be ready to forgive. And the theme of forgiveness is a major theme in the Gospel of Luke, isn't it? We've seen it a number of times. In the Lord's Prayer, it's embedded right in the prayer, right? Forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone who sins against us. We are to imitate God's forgiveness. Nehemiah 9, Nehemiah says that God stands ready to forgive. He's more ready to forgive than we are to repent. Jesus says, be merciful as your Father in heaven is merciful. Now, what does it really mean to forgive someone? Well, let me quote R.C. Sproul. Forgiveness, in biblical terms, means to hold a sin against a person no more. The Bible teaches, he says, that when God forgives, he casts our sins into the sea of forgetfulness and remembers them no more. Now, it would be absurd to interpret this to mean that the omniscient God suddenly suffers from amnesia, and can no longer recall that we had transgressed his law. God does not forget in that sense, but in a legal sense, he forgives. He forgets. He never brings charges against us again. Authentic forgiveness means that I say to you, I forgive you. I can never hold that against you again, nor mention it again to you or anyone else. Now that is not so much an attitude of the heart as a pattern of behavior. We are not to keep a record of past offenses, this is one of the hardest things in the world to do. So we've all come to that common conclusion. This is one of the hardest things to do. And what we must do is work the gospel into our lives and remember how much the Lord Jesus has forgiven us. That he hasn't held our sin against us. It's a remarkable thing to be forgiven. In, in the musical Hamilton, I haven't quoted in a month or two, they, they call forgiveness the unimaginable. And what Jesus has done for us is the unimaginable. He has cast our sin into the depths of the sea. And Jesus continues to forgive us day by day. He doesn't forgive us just seven times a day, but more like 7,000 times a day. And he's, he's called us to imitate his forgiveness. As Paul says to the Ephesians, be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. In the power of that forgiveness, following the pattern of that forgiveness, we forgive others. That's the way it's supposed to work. But we don't have that desire to do it if we don't ponder regularly the gospel and what Jesus has done for us. I've said before that the gospel is kind of like the old Coke machines. You know, machines you put coins in and, and you'd have to smack them, you know, for the, for the Coke to fall out. <laughs> At least that's where I grew up. And you, we'd, just, we'd hit the machine and, and finally it would fall out. My heart needs that with the gospel. I have to pound the gospel into my heart until it finally gets into the depth of my being and I have a power to then forgive people. I have a power to live a godly life. So, number three. He moves from forgiveness to faith. To faith. Now, this, this may be a result of what Jesus has just said. Recognizing that forgiveness is an unimaginable thing to receive and do. The disciples then request more faith. And it's interesting, if, if this is following on that line of, of thinking that they need the faith to forgive, it's interesting that they request faith and not love or some other Christian virtue. It's assumed that they have faith because they want an increase of faith. And it's interesting that they call Jesus Lord as well. They know he is the object of their faith He's the one who can increase their faith. And so they say, 
if we had uh, increased our faith. They didn't ask for more patience. They asked for more faith. That is more faith in the love of our Father. More faith in the grace of the Son. More faith in the power of the Spirit. That's what we need. We need to believe it. We need to believe the gospel. And that'll transform our relationships. And Jesus gives them a vivid image. He's already used this image in uh, Luke 13, a mustard seed. I almost brought one up here, but it would have been irrelevant because you couldn't see it if I had one up here. (laughs) Jesus says, if you have faith, the grain of a mustard seed, you could say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted and planted in the sea, and it would obey you. That's an amazing image, isn't it? Jesus says here, the issue is not the quantity of your faith, but the presence of real faith. It's not about great faith, per se, but genuine faith. If you have real faith in the right object, then surprising things can happen. And they're looking at the object of their faith when they make this request. And did Jesus not do great things with these knucklehead disciples? He took their mustard seed faith and they did remarkable things. Now, people may come to you as a Christian believer and say, I wish I had your faith. But what we should say in response is, you don't need my faith, you need my Savior. That's where the power of faith resides, in the object of our faith. You see, if you have genuine faith, whether small or great, you get the same Christ. The issue is, do you you have faith in that Christ? You think about the Israelites when they went through the Red Sea. God parted the sea. Old Testament picture of deliverance, salvation. You know some of those Israelites went through there all confident, some of them, but some of them were scared to death walking through that sea. And who got saved? Both of them. Those with great faith and those with mustard seed-like faith. The issue is, do you have faith in the right object? If you have faith in Jesus, he says, well, you could say to a mulberry tree, be uprooted and planted in the ocean. A mulberry tree, rabbis say, had roots that were 600 years old. They were tenacious roots, and they could not be uprooted by a human being. And Jesus says, if if you have the presence of real faith, surprising things can happen. What does this faith look like? It looks like clinging to God day by day. How many people do you talk to in these halls? Hey, man, how you doing? One day at a time. (laughs) That's mustard seed faith at work. Clinging to God day by day. It, It looks like resting in Christ's strength. It looks like seeking Christ's grace. It looks like obeying Christ's word when it's hard. It looks like trusting Jesus until you see Jesus. That's what it looks like to have this faith, a faith that can do surprising things. So Jesus speaks to them about the peril of sin, about the power of forgiveness, or the practice of forgiveness, about the power of faith, and finally, the posture of a servant. He speaks here about the attitude of a servant, and I think this is is important because, you know, if you're avoiding temptation, if you're practicing forgiveness, if you're seeing things happen because of your faith, your head could swell. And as Ralph Davis says, Jesus gives them this parable to cure the problem of hot stuff syndrome. (laughs) To let them know that when they serve Jesus, uh, it's actually a privilege, and they're just doing their job. And so it's a very, very interesting parable in a world where we want to hand out medals for everything, where everybody gets a trophy, and everyone wants applause. And we, just, we should quote this verse, these verses to them. Um, now, we shouldn't read this the wrong way. We shouldn't read any of the passages the wrong way. Um, but you could read this as, it's okay to be harsh to people, or uh, I'm going to go be rude to my spouse, or you know, uh, I'm going to start ordering them around. No, do not do that. Um, do point two and practice forgiveness a lot. That, that's, that's better. Jesus is simply making a point in this parable that we are unworthy servants. And we've already read this sort of thing. John the Baptist himself says about Jesus, I'm unworthy to untie his sandals. 
John the Baptist say that. We can certainly say that. So he begins with three rhetorical questions, and the answers are no, yes, and no. First question, he says, Will any of you as a servant plowing and keeping sheep say to him when he has come in from the field, Come at once and recline at table? And Jesus, using a scenario of his day, we, we may bristle at this pieces of this story in various ways, but this is just a common sort of uh, situation with a master and a servant, and the servant had to have various jobs. And so the servant would go from shepherd and farmer to chef. And so now that he's done from work, the master doesn't say, hey, sit at the table. No, now as part of his job description, it's his job to prepare the meal. And so that answer is no. Uh, is no. Second answer, he says, will he not rather say to him, prepare supper for me, dress properly, and serve me while I eat and drink, and afterward you will eat and drink? And that answer is yes. You must go from your outside work to your inside work. Third question, does he think the servant because he did what was commanded? No, because he's simply doing his job. He is not to receive special recognition or praise. You don't get a trophy for going to work on Tuesday. <laughs> Jesus boils it down to a principle, verse 10. So you also, when you have done all that you were commanded, say, we are unworthy servants, we have only done what was our duty. No medal on a Monday? No trophy on a Tuesday? No. You're simply doing your job. And I think Jesus is telling this story, again, it's a cure for hot stuff syndrome, as David says, to these disciples who were about to be lauded and, and, and looked up to and, and were about to see amazing things happen through them, through their faith. The posture is, we're only doing our duty. In other words, we are unworthy servants, and we owe Jesus everything. And the honor is in the service itself. That we get to serve Jesus at all is a remarkable privilege. We go to the Lord in prayer every morning, and we say, Lord Jesus, reporting for duty. What, what do you have for me today? I'm happy to do it. He's calling these disciples to humble servanthood. He transformed the world with this view of leadership, servant leadership. And Jesus is not just telling them to do things he was unwilling to do. He is the ultimate humble servant who did the unthinkable by coming and living the life we could never live and then dying on our behalf. This is a different image of success than the world where successful leaders are powerful and dominant. And the world is often motivated by recognition and praise. But Jesus' vision is one of servanthood. And the honor is in the service. The pleasure is in the service itself. Now again, we shouldn't press this parable too far. We shouldn't read this that Jesus doesn't take notice of our service or that he's harsh. We're going to read of another parable soon where Jesus says, Well done, good and faithful servant. Oh, he takes notice. Jesus delights in his saints. He delights in his servants. He's the Savior who washed the feet of his servants. This parable is not talking about our inherent worth in God's sight. We know it's precious. It's highlighting our function as a servant, our posture of total humility before God about the business of serving him. And this is in contrast to the Pharisees who in Luke 18 say, you know, I fasted five times a week and I tithe all of this. And, and they went about showing their, their righteousness before other people. This is a different posture that Jesus is leading these disciples to. So we're reminded here that we, we cannot boast before God or others because of our service. We're doing our job. We cannot put God in our debt by serving him. Thinking that now all of our problems ought to go away. That he now owes us for doing our job. No, we owe him everything. We're reminded that we belong to our master. Paul says, you are bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God with your body. For those who know the saving grace of Jesus today, you know that service to him is a privilege. It's a joy. And we know that we have grace to serve him. Where Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, I worked harder than all of them. Yet it wasn't I. It was the grace of God within me. So here are some basics for discipleship. 
What does Jesus want these disciples to know as he's training them? He wants them to beware of temptation and to not lead other people into sin. He wants them to rebuke sin when they see it properly and to forgive the repentant. He wants them to have a faith that will do surprising things in the world. And he wants them to serve God because it's simply their duty. It's their privilege. And one day, church, you and I, as unworthy servants, will be delivered from this world of temptation and sin. And we, the forgiven, will see what our mustard seed faith has brought us, a new creation. No more sin, no more suffering, no more death. And we will bow before the worthy one with all of the redeemed and join a song, you are worthy to take the scroll and open its seals. For you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you have made them a kingdom and priest to our God, and they shall reign forever. That's where our future is headed. And so it's our great joy to take his word, to put it into practice, and to know that we have power to do these things. When you read these things, you say, man, I really need help. And as a Christian, you have it. You have the helper, the Holy Spirit within you, enabling you to fight sin, to forgive people, to live by faith, and to serve Jesus. Praise be to God for the life we have now and the life that is promised to us in the future. Father, we thank you today for your word, for the practicality of it, for the timeliness of it. When we read these texts, we say, who is sufficient for these things? And we're grateful, Lord Jesus, that you don't leave us without power. You don't leave us without the helper. And we pray that by the power of your Holy Spirit, you would help us to pursue holiness, to fight temptation and sin, to lead people to truth and not away from the faith. You would give us the, the, uh, the, the courage to correct and the compassion to forgive. Even right now in our hearts, Lord, I pray if there are people that we, need, we know we need to forgive, we know we need to talk to, we pray that you would help us to obey your word. We pray that our, our faith would, would lead us to trust you more today, that we would see surprising things as we look to you for help and deliverance and miracle in certain situations. And we pray that you would give us the posture of a servant, Lord, not looking for recognition, not looking for fame, but simply serving Jesus because he's worthy of it. And we pray you would help us now by your spirit. In Jesus' good name we pray. Everybody said, amen.